Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we're going to get into questions about habits that could potentially, or even equipment choices that could be potentially affecting your training adversely. So let's get into it. We have Coach Chad, and it's just us two amigos today. Um, so we'll make it happen. Harrison's question says, hey, all at Trainer Road, thanks so much for an amazing product and podcast. Y'all are amazing. Thank you, Harrison. Uh, unfortunately, I'm injured at the moment, but seem to be on my way to recovery. Anyhow, onto the question, my brother-in-law is a strength athlete, and for Christmas, amongst other things, has gifted me a bag of creatine. And so my question is, what part, if any, does creatine have to play in nutrition for an endurance athlete? Are its effects contrary to our goals, or could it help? Could this change when, for example, one is injured? Thanks for all you do. Hopefully, I'll be back on the trainer consistently soon. From Harrison. Now, Chad, we've covered creatine before, but I figured since New Year, uh, lots of folks are probably setting goals and changing their up their nutrition. And this is one of the most commonly recommended supplements for athletes, just generally. And endurance athletes could be coming across that. And like I said, in uh, episode two sixty two, we covered this in depth. We covered it even before that. But what uh, what do you have to say to Harrison in this case? And is there anything new that you found on it? Yeah. So so first off, I'll do a brief recap. But uh, again, we you said. Uh, Ask a Cycling Coach 262. I came across 250 where we had Justin Rossi and Pete Morris on. And then there was a subsequent or maybe prior uh, Trainer Road blog post written by Sean Hurley in which, I mean, it gives you a synopsis of what it, the good and the bad and where it might benefit us, but it also links to a list, a long list of peer-reviewed articles. So you can, I mean, you could probably bring yourself completely up to speed I won't say quickly because there are a lot of articles listed to that listed with that, but just reading that blog post will bring you up to speed. But to uh, summarize, in a nutshell, creatine phosphate is in our muscles and it helps us generate ATP. And then the the logic is that by supplementing creatine, we can enhance this capability by effectively growing this particular energy store. And, and this totally bears out. We can indeed increase our muscle creatine stores. Um, and it's, you'll, you'll see it spoken of, written of as simply increased muscle creatine. So, so this, this is true, but a quick review of creatine supplementation with regards to endurance performance tells us this may not exactly be juice that's worth the squeeze, right? So for time trial performance, uh, they, one study, they co-supplemented with carbohydrate and that kind of just makes me question. I mean, I, what, what can we infer from that? How do, how do we tease out those two things from one another? Another look at sprint performance, but it did it at the end of a road race. So we're not talking about where creatine really shines so much as at the end of something that's really uh, t muscularly and you know, physiologically on a lot of levels taxing. So I'm just going to say nope. And the study basically said nope as well. And then when it comes to workout performance, this is one case where I've been particularly interested. Like when you're doing high intensity repeats, such as like 30 second sprints gapped by four and a half minutes of recovery, that sort of thing. I'd love to see, and there might be research, but again, nothing I've found. So, you know, my advice would be try it and see and get back to me. I'd love to find out what you, what you learn. And then as far as endurance performance in general, juries, I guess you could say the jury's still out, but it doesn't look good. Not, not in terms of endurance performance, which brings us to an article, <clears throat> excuse me, a research paper by Forbes, very recent, 2022, just a little while ago. And the title basically says it all. It's the effects of creatine supplementation on properties of muscle, bone, and brain function in older athletes and narrative review. So muscle, bone, brain, we're going to look at each of those. Yeah, it is older uh, adults, but I think that probably uh, probably encapsulates most of us and there are uh, ramifications for younger athletes. And then uh, keep in mind, it is a narrative review and it's still peer reviewed, but this is effectively a glorified blog post. It doesn't mean that the information contained therein isn't still valid and worth reading and scientifically backed, but let's just say they're a bit more flexible in nature. And then credit where credit's due, I did call most of what I'm about to share with you from a mass article. So thank you, Eric Trexler. Mass being the, the guys over at Science and Sport. Uh, nope, Stronger by Science. Okay, so to, to preface this, uh, older adults typically face, especially sedentary ones, uh, uh, affliction or a physiological uh, going on termed osteosarcopenia. And this is basically simultaneous osteoporosis, which is, you know, the, the, the reduction in bone mass and bone density coupled with sarcopenia, which is an age-related decline in muscle mass and muscle strength. So this kind of sets the stage for the muscle component of this discussion. So the most touted benefits of creatine are, and just a bit of review here, increased high-intensity performance and increased muscle strength. 
So, so to, to put it another way, we're talking about max efforts and maybe particularly repeated max efforts, not just a one and done, but being able to recycle and do it again. So think heavy lifts in, in succession, sprints, uh, explosive muscle actions like jumping, things of that nature. And of course, you know, like I just said, reps thereof. And then with regard to recovery, one study kind of summed up at least the positive side of things, and I'll just quote them. It says creatine supplementation may speed up recovery time between bouts of intense exercise by mitigating muscle damage and promoting faster recovery of lost force production potential. So again, it's not nothing. It's not without benefit, but it's not terribly applicable to endurance performance. And then <clears throat> briefly, because this is going to kind of factor into this later, the dosing recommendation, if you decide you're going to supplement with creatine, is three to five grams per day. And then you're looking at about a three to five or three to four week time course before you see somewhere in the ballpark of 20 to 40% increase in muscle creatine saturation. If, however, you're in a hurry, you can creatine load. It could be potentially a little tougher on the gastric system, but in that case, it'd be 20 to 25 grams per day, five to seven days, roughly the same outcome achieved. And it is important to note that there's a variable response, meaning that about 20 to 30% of folks are classified as non-responders. And this is typically attributed to the fact that they're already uh, athletes or people with high creatine, muscle creatine saturation. So they're already there. This small increase in the dosage doesn't do anything for them. And then finally, it's widely accepted as non-dangerous uh, for a number of reasons, but one is that the downregulation of our endogenous so our internal creatine production, which is on the order of about a gram a day, during supplementation does not lead to long-term suppression. So just because we supplement with it for a while and then we decide, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, doesn't mean we're going to have any long-lasting effects. Okay, so that's the muscle side of things, and that's really the review side of things. So what I wanted to talk about was kind of some lesser-known benefits of creatine. And, and basically, I'll, I'll just cut to the chase. What I'm saying here is it's not necessarily something that's going to damage your performance as an endurance athlete. The real downside is that it will be coupled with weight gain. That weight gain is water, but it is more weight to carry around. So that's really, as far as I can tell, the only downside. A lot of upsides, and, and the ones I just listed in terms of the muscular system, but when it comes to bone, and again, this study is looking at older adults, but this particular aspect of creatine supplementation actually applies to younger athletes, as I mentioned earlier, and we're actually going to circle back to that in a little bit. Before that, <clears throat> a couple of the potential bone beneficial mechanisms. Um, again, creatine can enhance muscle strength, high intensity performance, and this sets the stage for larger, stronger muscles, which means that we're capable of more forceful contractions. And when this, when this occurs, this is greater stress at the musculotendinous joints or junctions, sorry. So where the tendon inserts into the bone, it's greater stress on that. In addition to it's also uh, th th these more forceful contractions lead to greater compressive forces along the muscle axis or along the bone axis rather. So, you know, when we, when we contract our muscles, when we do it forcefully, that, that larger muscle, effectively larger muscle compresses against the bone. It's these compressive forces that actually lead to, and coupled with this musculotendinous stress, uh, stimulated bone growth. So these two things lead to the, to, to the same, same end. And if we recall, bone remodeling is, is basically a combination of resorption and osteogenesis. And this is much like protein turnover, where we try to balance the degradation side with the synthetic side, right? We want a positive, ideally, you know, we favor one side of that relation. We want to do things that support bone and, you know, muscle growth. And that's, that's what we're trying to achieve here. So the nutshell is that creatine actually paves the way for increased mechanical loading. And then secondly, bones rely on a creatine reaction for energy production. And this is tied to creatine kinase. We don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but this could lead to greater ATP production in the bone, which could simultaneously, and I say could, increase activity of the osteoblasts, which are the cells involved in bone formation. And then uh, that's the osteogenesis side of things that I just mentioned. And then enhanced production of, and, and this pronunciation is difficult, osteoprotegerin, I'm going to guess. And this is the protein that decreases bone resorption. So, you know, all that sounds positive, but for now, there's a very limited number of randomized controlled trials. And those results paint a picture that, as Eric Trexler termed it, generally quite underwhelming. But three things. One, it's not harmful. Aside from the weight gains effect on performance, perhaps, you know, and that's just harmful in terms of performance, this stuff has been tested, I mean, second probably only to caffeine, and I'm not even sure it's second to caffeine. There are mountains and mountains and mountains <clears throat> of research studies on this particular supplement. And then secondly, 
anything that lends itself to strength training, anything that enhances strength training can lead to greater longevity, quality of living, uh, muscular coordination, which can lead to less falls, less uh, likelihood of bone fractures, et cetera particularly relevant to older athletes. And then when we get back to the younger athletes, it brings me to the third sub point here is that bones typically see more adaptation in our younger years. So maybe it's more productive, more promising uh, time to reap the, these, these bone health benefits of creatine, be it supplementation or adequate day-to-day -day dietary acquisition. So however you go about getting it. And I mentioned the latter, that day-to-day -day acquisition, because there are concerns around the, the meat-based nature of dietarily obtained creatine, which brings me to finally the effects on brain health. First off, it's important to recognize that creatine supplementation doesn't influence brain creatine supply. Muscle, yes, brain, not as evidently. And evidence of this is, is supported by the fact that vegetarians exhibit lower muscle creatine levels, as you might expect, but they typically have the same levels of brain creatine. Um, there are, are suspicions that exist that higher creatine doses in some of these randomized controlled trials would actually lead to a change in brain creatine levels, but they'd have to be pretty high doses. Typically, we're talking three to five grams a day. This would be 20 grams a day long term. At least that's the theory. So the question is, where's the potentially brain beneficial link, link sorry, to creatine supplementation? And so far, positive data really exists within specific subsets of people only. At least that's what's been studied so far. So those suffering from Alzheimer's, uh, similar age-related cognitive decline disorders, depression, traumatic brain injury is especially interesting when it comes to concussions, which is especially relevant to us as endurance athletes, hypoxia, and we're not talking about manufactured or temporary types that, that we contrive, sleep deprivation, this is probably be more along the lines of insom insomniacs, but the, you know, the, the more pathological forms of uh, the hypoxia and the sleep deprivation, but really simply, creatine plays a pivotal role in the constant energy supply to our very energy-hungry brain tissue. And as such, the, the potential, the favorable outcomes to supplementation could stem from, again, improved cognitive function, reductions in symptoms of psychological conditions, and potentially a slowing of the progression of any brain-affecting conditions. So nutshell here is that any brain-related effects of creatine supplementation equal for lack of a better description, a neutral to slightly positive effect. At least in the typical doses, higher may lead to more profound effects. So what I'm getting to recap this chat is that as a cyclist, creatine poses potential benefits for uh, for strength gain, mm -hmm. for bone density, which is a big problem for us yeah. cyclists. because Bone density through strength gain. Sport. Yep. Yep, through strength gain. Uh, also potentially for injury management or recovery, which in Harrison, in your case, it sounds like this could be particularly interesting. Perhaps Harrison, you are on this beat and that's why you asked this. I would assume so. <clears throat> but then also even like potentially cognitive benefits. The only downside is the fact that weight gain happens. Chad, I think this is far from a scientific experiment, but I think that when I was, I'm not taking creatine now, but when I have before while training, I think mm -hmm. that it gave me it, I, I gained like almost six pounds. Um, I have no yeah. clue if that's just my experience though. And, and who knows that could have been due to any number of different things, not controlling my nutrition. Exactly. Right. I, I can't really say, do you Maybe, know roughly but, about how much you can expect to gain? I don't, but I do know this, something similar happened to me. I'm pretty sure Nate could weigh in on this topic. And I know he, he basically salivates anytime we talk about creatine and, and <laughs> rightly so, because it is, you know, it is bankable. Um, I know, I remember Bryce, one of our former support staffers talking about this very thing. So it's pretty commonplace. I mean, it is the, the toll you have to pay, but in the case of, and this is still kind of controversial, the, where, where that water is stored, whether it's extracellular or intracellular can have different effects on your, the appearance, your, your aesthetic. So some, some insist that it's in the cell, in which case it blows up your muscle fibers and you just look more ripped. Others say it's, it's outside of the cell, in which case you just look bloated. And then others say there's no real correlation. We can't really tie creatine intake to a particular increase in either of those particular body water stores. I mean, that's when things get stored in our body, they're stored with water, right? Um, and when we're talking about carbohydrate and how performance enhancing carbohydrate is, it also comes with weight gain. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not gotcha. weight gain in terms of fat gain. It's when you store, what is it? One gram uh, of carbohydrate takes four grams of water. Is that correct, Chad? Yeah, I see it right? anywhere from so. two to four. Depends what you read. Uh, safely, I think it's three, 3.5. Yep. 
So as a result, yeah, you do way more, but your performance potential increases. So this is an interesting, interesting perspective. What I've seen athletes do is cycle creatine, right? In the sense that they'll use it through a training phase. And then as they get closer, like into their specialty phase, as they get close to an event, they'll wean themselves off it like four weeks prior Mm. and then try to Mm. give it enough time to be able to lose that, that additional weight that they were storing in terms of water. So that seemed like a sound uh, strategy. That sounds like just the right way to go from an endurance athlete perspective from a strength athlete. I don't know, maybe a physique athlete, if they find, in fact, it does make them look bloated and they attribute it specifically to the creatine and they phase out the creatine and find that indeed, but even then they have to assume that they're not doing other things, which they probably are if they're in a, a cutting phase. So it gets, the waters get pretty muddy pretty fast. Yeah, no doubt. This is like one of the interesting moments where us endurance athletes and strength athletes uh, actually have something that we can connect upon. Like we're, mm-hmm. we're connected on something that could be beneficial mm-hmm. for us. You know? Yeah. This and caffeine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we may not be and then there's a, all the other stuff, but. <laughs> and then there's a, a synergistic, a potentially synergistic effect between those, but that looks not too promising at all. So, and that is a concern when, when it comes to creatine supplementation is do, uh, if I also <clears throat> am a caffeine, uh, or if I'm also intaking, I guess, caffeine, can that have the negative impacts on the, what I could derive from the creatine. And it looks like the, there, there's obviously no additive effect between the two. There might be a counter effect to caffeine ingestion along with creatine ingestion. So if you are going the creatine route, caffeine may not serve your purposes as well as it could on its own, but that's still kind of wishy-washy. Interesting. Um, can I ask you two questions? They may be dumb that you may also not have the answers for them. Uh, so if, if creatine is, is increasing our creatine stores within our muscles, mm. you were talking about studies that looked at like sprint performance at the end of a road race. There's just so many variables in that. It's really tricky. Like you mm-hmm. said, mm-hmm. um, but could this, would this help our creatine? Cause when we we really do that absolute all out sprint, mm-hmm. we drain that creatine phosphate stores. We train, drain those very quickly. And then we move into those largely aerobic stores that we have, and then we're just left with that until we run out of oxygen, right? Yeah, anaerobic um, stores and aerobic stores coupled. Yes. But the, the, the alactic stores, which is what you're talking about, I think that where it gets tricky is it, it's a reservoir. So, so if you creatine supplement and you have a big creatine reservoir and you can load that up, that's all good and fine. But when you spend it, it's a matter of regenerating it. So if you can't regenerate it in time, it really doesn't matter how big that store is. If you run it down in the... <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the, uh, lead out or the run in to the lead out to the sprint, then it, it doesn't matter how big that reservoir was. Once you deplete it, you got to let it regenerate. Otherwise it's simply not going to be there when, when the time comes. So yeah, it's, it, it's a bigger gas tank, a bigger creatine gas tank, but you have to replenish that gas tank such that it's available and full when you need it to be. And that was my question of, do we know about replenishment rates and if creatine <laughs> supplementation affects a replenishment rates in any specific way? Uh, I, that I don't know. I do know that uh, with conditioning, creatine replenishment rates do change. So there are athletes, and I think it's conditionable to, to coin a term, but uh, I don't. We, we did talk about this quite a while back. So at, at one point, I did share some research on this particular matter, but I can't recall it specifically. But I do remember... Pretty well. I feel pretty good saying that it is trainable to some, to some degree. Uh, Bro science logic would assume that a larger creatine store would take longer to replenish. Sure. That's perhaps what you're doing and unless it somehow also affects your, your rate of replenishment, you can train that rate. Like you said, it's conditionable to train that rate. Um, but what if taking creatine and just having massive, you know, massively increased creatine stores, ends up making it so that it's more difficult to be able to use them, but perhaps it's the same rate. I don't know. I'm talking myself in the knots, but it's a, it's a, it's an interesting concept because Mm -hmm. especially for athletes that are dealing with, uh, events that have those repeated bouts. And when I say repeated bouts, I'm not saying just nonstop hits. It takes a little while for that creatine phosphate to come back, especially when you're, you're in an active state that's still relatively, Mm -hmm. you know, high intensity. Um, but if you're the sort of athlete that needs to sprint hard to get a gap in the beginning, and then you're going to sit in and sprint at the end, this is absolutely what matters to you. I think Um, so. That sounds perfectly logical. Yeah. 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 And if you're, and that sounds like a criterium in a lot of cases for me and the sort of racers that win criteriums tend to race that way, instead of just attacking nonstop, I'm the attack nonstop guy that doesn't win races, Um, (laughs) but they, uh, so, and in those cases, chances are your races are a bit more flat and weight doesn't matter as much too. It really seems like creatine. You're you're good at hiding, good at conserving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, because like the replenishment, the, the replenishment is the tricky part. I mean, it's kind of like uh, when we try to replenish anaerobic stores, and we have to we have to reduce our work to a particular level. Otherwise, the replenishment takes place at such a painfully slow rate that it's just we, we never really get there. So yeah. it's tricky. You have to again. You have to. We've said many times, it's it's where you're going to burn your matches, where you're going to. Uh, you know, make those those uh, potentially meaningful moves. You have to be selective because you've only got so many of them. You can only repeat them at s- uh, such and such a rate. And a lot of the times when they're gone, they're gone, it, it, yeah. at least in terms of a single race context. It seems like it could also be good for multi-sport athletes that are really just doing a lot of, a lot of work on the body. Um, you know, if you're doing a lot of running, a lot of swimming, a lot of biking, and the weight doesn't matter quite as much for you, uh, especially when we're talking about training, you can cycle off of this once you get toward your event, but this really seems like a good preventative measure that doesn't have a whole lot of downside for you. Um, as a multi-sport mm-hmm. athlete, I may end up, uh, bringing creatine back into my supplementation routine. So mm-hmm. thanks Chad. And thanks Harrison for the question. If you want to submit a question like Harrison, you can go to trainerroadcom slash podcast. Please do that. You submitted awesome questions this week. It's great. And it's what keeps this podcast going. Uh, Chris says, hope this is not a terrible question. I know the use of socks and I should say of dimpled socks has a reasonable impact on aerodynamics, just like the dimples that are on a golf ball. But why is it that helmets and bike frames, which I suspect comprise an equal, if not greater surface area, don't employ the same strategy. Thanks so much. I greatly enjoy your episodes. So, uh, this is talking about like, you can see the socks or like Chris Froome famously in that skin suit and other athletes that I believe have been on Ineos, that team, they've had these inserts, basically they're wearing like a a base layer and that base layer has strategically placed relief pads that, that end up creating dimples underneath their skin suit. And then with that, or, uh, you know, on the skin suit surface. And then the goal with that is to increase aerodynamics. Uh, so yes, it is used in some cases. We also, Louis Garneau had a helmet called the Vortice, and that one also had dimples on the front of it as well. Um, however, it's not used very commonly. And like Chris says, why is it not used across that? So engineers go ahead and send me messages. I'm probably going to screw up big time on this one. I looked at some studies. I also talked to my brother. Uh, he's, he's an actual rocket scientist uh, on, and he deals with this stuff all the time. Uh, but just the same, blame me, not my brother for any mistakes that I make. I want to talk about dimples first. And we've seen this on golf balls and there are varying different sizes, depths, even shapes. Some are hexagonal or some are just circular, uh, in their shape. But the goal of them is to modify the turbulent boundary layer of an object to, to help create more laminar flow of that object as it moves through the air. And I'll explain that. So basically if you look at a golf ball and the air hits it, that when that air hits the ball, there's resistance and it has to break its way around that ball. Then as it ends up getting to the midpoint of that ball, the air starts to detach from the ball. And as a result, there's this big zone of negative pressure that causes turbulent air. You can, you've felt this if you've gone behind like a semi truck before and you're driving and you get behind them and you feel that zone where you're kind of getting buffeted around left and right, left and right. And then if you get close, it's nice and calm. And that's all turbulent air that's created by just this wind flowing over this object and suddenly having nothing to flow against. So it then, and it has this low pressure sucking it in. So it creates turbulent air and that's drag. And it actually makes the object move slower through the air. So what dimples do is they, they modify just that the, the very kind of, if you think of it just like a ring or like a, just a, a stroke or an additional layer around the ball, the dimples modify what the air is doing right around the ball. And the dimples create a nice little turbulent layer that interestingly creates friction with the air that's flowing over the golf ball. And that friction keeps the air attached to that golf ball past the midpoint so that there's a smaller negative zone coming out of that golf ball at the end. And what it does is it decreases drag because you don't have that big negative drag area or negative um, uh, pressure area after the ball. And as a result, the ball can fly, some people say, two times as far uh, based on the dimples. Now, here's the interesting, and I guess another way to think about this, because I'm probably doing a bad job of explaining it, but um, think of like you're trying to balance the pressure in front and behind the object to the best degree possible. And in most cases, the pressure is going to be more negative behind it. And as a result, it's going to cause drag. And if you think of like the wake of a boat, if it's really broad, then there's going to be great pressure or greater pressure between the differential between the front and the back of the boat. 
Um, so if you had dimples in this case, what it would do is it would aim to make that wake less broad. And as a result, there would be less drag uh, created from it. Now, there's a study that was done, and this is an interesting one where it actually looked at applying golf ball dimples to surfaces of a vehicle, and it applied it to the hood and applied it to the trunk of the vehicle. And this was just like a very basic car model that represented the standard dimensions of a typical small sedan car. And the researcher said the most significant change was obtained in case four, where the dimple depth was 14 millimeters at 60 kilometers per hour. So that's not too far off from what you'd see of like a fast cycling moment, right? When a a person's riding fast, the coefficient of drag was reduced by 9.4% by adding those dimples onto the hood and the trunk, which is substantial, right? Um, 10% is, is, is huge. That's the sort of thing that cycling marketers dream of (laughs) at those companies. But the interesting thing is they tested different dimple depths and different dimple like, uh, 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 setups and, and the results varied widely. And actually, there was another uh, research that looked at, uh, this is from Abbas and colleagues, they looked at different golf balls that are on the market that have different dimple designs, and they said it has been established with this research that golf ball drag coefficient varies considerably as the dimple geometry is varied. So let's bring this back into cycling and why it isn't all over everything. There's a few reasons. Number one, it's really complex. As we can see, just adding on dimples isn't the right thing. You have to be able to add them on in the exact right way for that surface and how the ball, how the object is moving through the air. The tricky part about this is that, uh, on a bike, it's a really complex aerodynamic problem to solve on a golf ball. You have a round object and it's spinning as it moves through the air. So they kind of apply just a broad stroke approach of adding dimples all over the object. And then that should help it. But then when you talk about a bike, you have a lot of leading and trailing edges. You have moving legs, you have, all the complexities of spinning wheels. And then you have a fork, you have a down tube, you have bottle cages, you have a seat tube, you have the top tube and you have your handlebars. You have all these surfaces. And as the air moves over that bike, the air is doing different things constantly. And the object in front of it affects how the air flows over the object behind it. It's truly just incredibly complex. So Dimples seem to be best for objects, uh, particularly that can't be modified in other ways. You can't make a golf ball pointed like an arrow helmet. It would probably fly a whole lot better, but since it's round, they put the dimples on there and it works just fine. But in this case, they, you know, with helmets, you can make a helmet really aerodynamically shaped. You can make it have these long tails. You can have a cam tail where it cuts off strategically in a specific spot at a specific angle. You can do all those things. And the bike frame is similar in this regard. We can't just, um, We can change the shapes of the frame within the UCI rules, but they can change the shapes that you have the tube shapes pretty substantially. And what that ends up doing is that ends up achieving the aerodynamic efficiency that you're going for without adding something like dimples. Um, And that's why we see them on socks too, because you can't change the shape of your legs. and, And that's why it's beneficial. They're particularly good on things like cylinders. And that's why you see them applied on Chris Froome's arms or on lower legs as well. Um, but I think that it's really important to just like come back to this and to say that aerodynamics are extremely complicated and just adding one design method to improve aerodynamic efficiency won't necessarily improve the aerodynamic efficiency of the object. Like context is just absolutely everything. So uh, don't be surprised if you see that, like you'll see even like in some like military applications on ships, they'll have like random panels of different textures on a ship and that will, you know, smooth out air or water flowing over the ship in a specific spot. Same thing with aircraft. Um, we could see that with bikes as we, I think now every bike shape seems to have a cam tail on it and frame shapes are almost all the same. So maybe that's the next thing that we see is this like clever integration of different textures and surfaces. But as of now, I think the reason that it's not involved is because just adding it to adding dimples to the surface of a frame won't necessarily make it faster. Uh, it's a really complicated problem. So that's really, I think why, you know, something interesting, Chad, I don't know if you were here with me. I was, we were in Kona and we were talking to somebody who would know about these things Hmm. and they were telling us that because Trek had still not released the speed concept, the new version that's out now. And they said that they, you know, they have teams of engineers working on it constantly coming up with different designs and they simply couldn't beat the previous speed, speed concept. I remember that. I think it was the the flow flow guys. Yeah. Uh, I think it was at that event that we were at with them, but perhaps not them. I can't remember, Hmm. but 
the interesting thing about that is that you'd think that they would just be well, just throw some dimples on it and it'll get faster or do yeah. a certain trick. But it's such a <coughs> complex problem to solve because everything's moving and dynamic and you're dealing with different yaw angles and, and that's, crosswinds. It's just that's the only wild. thing you didn't, you didn't mention that, I mean, just adds further complexity and probably compounds the complexity times a hundred is the, what direction is the resistance coming from? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's really interesting, but I do think we're, we're kind of at a point where almost all the bikes are looking the same now. So I would not be surprised if we start to see this sort of thing brought in to, and if brands do it right, there's an opportunity to do it right. And there's an opportunity to just market that you're doing it right. And if brands do it mm. right, then we could see some like meaningful improvements in aerodynamic efficiency, but stepping back from the whole thing, remember that if you're a road cyclist in particular, and you're looking at all this aero equipment, in most cases, you should probably be in somebody's draft for 90% of a race at least. So remember that like these things that you're probably spending a huge amount of money on and fretting over are likely having minimal to no impact for 90% of the time. Uh, granted that 10% is weighted heavily. It doesn't, it does matter, but, uh, I think that we all perhaps put a little too much emphasis on aero gains, uh, for road racers. So worth considering. Okay. Ozzy's question it says, Hey guys, I've been doing two to three structured trainer row workouts a week, one threshold, one VO2 with an additional two to three outdoor rides in the three to four hour range, mentioning Z2 as much as possible. Um, my question is, does it help hinder or make no difference to incorporate a structured ride into an unstructured outdoor ride? To clarify, today I did one hour of zone two straight into one of your workouts called Rubicon, followed by another 90 minutes at zone two to zone three with a break and descents after this workout. So last week I did a four hour ride with one of your workouts named Paiute minus five coming in the third hour before finishing off with an hour of zone one and zone two. So in other words, they're sandwiching, right? Chad, they have, mm -hmm. they're doing lower intensity beforehand, they're doing their workout and they're finishing off with low intensity thereafter. When I do these sorts of workouts, I generally take an additional day of recovery in the week. So typically I may ride six days a week, three structured, three unstructured, but if I combine a structured workout in the middle of an unstructured ride, I'll take the following day off. The benefits to this may be that my body is adapting to doing harder efforts later in the ride while also giving myself extra time to recover and adapt. But the cons may be that I'm somehow diminishing the quality of the trainer road structured ride. I'm not really sure. And then additional information, fueling at 80 to 90 grams of an hour, or grams an hour of carbs with lots of fluid and sodium. And I feel fine when I get home. Love the podcast, love FTP, de AI FTP detection, and most importantly, love train road, six stars. Thanks. Uh, appreciate that, Ozzy. And in this case, if you haven't used AI FTP detection, go do it right now. See what your FTP is. Go sign up for trainer road, build your best plan yet. It's going to be a great year. Uh, Chad, this sandwiching method is pretty mm -hmm. common for, for mm -hmm. lots of folks, um, in, in practically speaking, many cases, we just have to commute to where we can do our workout effectively if we're doing it outside and then we commute back. Right. So yeah. uh, in some cases it's just inherent. What are your thoughts on this in terms of affecting the quality of the structured ride as their main concern? Yeah. Well, to, to start things off, Ozzy has a really good grasp on asking the, the right questions. Definitely has a, their finger on the, the right pulse here, what, what should be of concern is one, diluting the, the quality of the workouts that need to be high quality in nature. It's not to say there isn't a ton of benefit to be gained from the Z2 riding, but it's really easy to nail the quality of a Z2 ride. You just, it doesn't take nearly as much focus as working on threshold and for sure not your, your VO2 max, um, or doing VO2 max intervals rather. Uh, so, so that, that's the right question. It's hard to imagine. <clears throat> I mean, you're going to need some basis for comparison here. So if you've done these workouts independently of this, the, this sandwiching of Z2, uh, endurance effort level, then you can say when I do it without it, I, I ride this well and I can hit these numbers and it, the workout exacts this sort of toll on me psychologically, et cetera. That's really the only way you're going to be able to compare these. So um, I, I guess you would just have to decide whether or not the overall outcome is still what you want it to be. Are you still improving? Are you still improving at a rate that you typically expect? Um, are you happy with your performance when it comes race day? Are you happy with your performance uh, as it as your fitness builds from week to week, et cetera? So th that is the risk you're running, but I do think these are extremely practical, both in terms of when you don't have the time to ride five times a week and you need to mash a couple of workouts together. It absolutely can be done. 
And the fact that you're following this, if you do two of your workouts in one day, then you follow it with the day of recovery is probably, is in my opinion, the absolute correct way to go until you decide, well, I can actually still ride that next day as long as I keep it easy. But you're erring on the side of caution, which I think is very sensible. And you've obviously got a high level of fitness because you're not just bookending these hard workouts with 30 minutes getting to the ride and 30 minutes coming home from the ride. You're doing a couple hours prior, a couple hours post. These are long rides with a whole lot of intensity in between, which to me says these, I, I don't know what time of season you're in, but I can assume you're coming right up on race season or you're in the midst of it because that's the sort of fitness you have to have to be competitive in. And I'm not even sure if you mentioned what type of racer you are. Yeah. But I'm going to assume a, a road racer, basically that's what this looks like. But, it, and, and, and that's further context that might actually sway how I feel about this approach. But in any case, if the fitness is improving, you're making the most of your time, you're nailing the quality of your workouts. It's, it's hard to find fault in, in this, this sandwich uh, approach. Yeah, this is, so you can know if, if the were of the, of the workouts are working and if you're improving in two ways, number one, or I should say you can know if the opposite is happening. And if it isn't working, number one, you're not able to hit your intervals like you plan to, uh, or like is prescribed. And if you are having to adjust because you're feeling excess fatigue, then you should definitely look at backing it off. There's this assumption that just adding on Z1 or Z2 is fine, and it doesn't, and it almost has like no negative effect or no fatigue effect on you. And the fact is that it's not the case. It does have a fatigue effect on you, even if it's easy. It's still, you're not in a just a, a, a sedentary state. You're not recovering. You're actually working. So this is a, a big uh, this is common. And like I said, somewhat of a necessity for some people, if they're doing their training outside, because you have to commute to and from, but boy, I see a lot of athletes, a lot of athletes do this and they are not riding zone one or zone two in between. Uh, they're letting themselves drift up high when they go over climbs, they're chasing an occasional calm. They get passed by a rider or they have a rider in front of them. And they just have to pass that rider or they can't get passed by a rider behind them all these little things end up pushing it. Like the other day I was looking at an athlete's ride on the forum and they were supposed to be doing just like a zone two ride. Uh, they had an FTP of like 235 Watts and they got a one minute PR of 460 Watts, uh, during that Z two ride. Right. And in their mind, they're like, yeah, I just nailed my Z two ride. And I know that that seems like extreme and you're probably thinking, Oh, I would never do that. But take a really critical eye. If your power profile, when you're supposed to be doing zone one and zone two is not flat, and is not something that represents the sort of intensity that you should see in zone one and zone two. If it's varying all the time, you are not getting that zone one, zone two sort of uh, uh, benefit from this of not working yourself too hard. As a result, going back to what I'm saying here, it's kind of sneaky because you may be able to hit your workouts just fine for a week, maybe even two weeks. But then after a couple of weeks, you'll start to wonder why you aren't be able to, aren't you, why you're not able to hit those targets. And then you instantly start to think of all the wrong things instead of think of the most obvious thing, which is the fact that a good chunk, a majority, if you look even potentially, or at the very least 20 to 30% of your time in the week is under the premise of structured, actually totally unstructured. And as a result, you're throwing in something that's unpredictable and you're expecting a predictable result. And that's why you've got this dissonance. But in most cases, what we tend to do is we tend to blame the training. We tend to blame nutrition. We tend to blame sleep, something like that. And while those things all are important, really, if you're not being specific with your inputs, don't expect a specific output. So this is uh, something where, like Chad said, so at first you can recognize it if very early on you aren't able to hit the, the targets of your workouts. Yeah, then this is a bad idea. Um, if you are just noticing that you're not getting the sort of return or the performance when it, you should be having it is just not very good, then look at backing off the fatigue. And this always comes back to the same point that I have. Let's just assume that this isn't a necessity for you and that you're just doing this out of choice. If this means that, uh, you know, on a given day, you have three hours to ride and you spend one hour riding two, one hour doing your workout, one hour riding back, could you restructure things and maybe do more than an hour of that structured work and actually be getting more benefit? It's worth asking. Like there's, you know, just throwing things full of zone two is definitely in vogue right now. And it's like, yeah, that's just like, I'll just do a couple intense workouts. And then after that, I'll just throw in a bunch of zone two and that can absolutely work. But for a lot of people, it doesn't necessarily mean optimal training or getting toward optimal training. 
So if you have more time available and if you aren't to the point where you're noticing diminishing returns or, or, you know, lackluster performance, then maybe look at just instead of adding in all that time with lower intensity, maybe spend more time with higher structured stuff, maybe more sweet spot work, something like that. And then I have a feeling I know where you're going with this, with the, with the second method. And I didn't mention it because I try to remain uh, training platform agnostic, but it's clear that Ozzy is a trainer road subscriber having I would think you know named a couple of the workouts very specifically so just tr pay attention to your progression levels if from week to week you're not managing those progressions you're not managing to uh, progress then th there there you go there's there's a very clear indicator and of course it can't it, it may not just be about the fact that you're sandwiching workouts and coupling workouts it could be about other things as Jonathan just elaborated on but it is a a, a first red flag for sure yep uh, cool. Maria's question. Love your podcast, especially the scientific questions and answers. I'm a recreational athlete who rides just for fun and question. And my question mostly stems from scientific curiosity. Do some athletes produce more heat than others? Why? What are the implications? For example, amount of calories burnt performance, et cetera. Uh, for a bit of background, uh, she, and I do want to share this, even though she said, feel free to skip this if it's too long, but I think it's important to share it. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, she says, I seem to heat up more than other people when I exercise, evidenced by the fact that the people regularly ask me if I'm not feeling cold because I'm wearing lighter clothes than others. For example, my trainer is placed in an unheated space, and I can easily do trainer road endurance sessions just in shorts, uh, or just in a sports bra on shorts at around 3 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I'm still sweating in those conditions when the fan is off. My mother told me she liked holding my hands as a little girl when going on walks because they were always warm. So this appears to be a predisposition of mine. Or could my perception be off? When I'm not exercising, my body temperature and sensation are normal. Sitting around, I feel cold as soon as the next person. The downside of this is that I easily overheat in the summer during bike rides and have come close to collapsing more than once when I don't strategically manage heat. My somewhat lower blood pressure might play into this. I'm curious to hear if the science, in quotes, uh, has anything to say on this topic. Uh, Chad, there's a lot of different ways that we can take this one. Mm -hmm. um, where do you want yeah, to go? it's uh, it's kind of tricky just because of a couple of the later comments where she cools down normally, Maria cools down normally. Um, uh, so I, I've got some information to share with you. Um, I don't have all the answers, as I so often do, but I, I'm going to give you my best guess or at least some information that may you know help you recognize that we don't all heat at the same rate. We don't all reside at the same core and what's termed, I guess, shell body temperatures. So the, the, I think the question here is, it has to do with not necessarily overheating, but just, uh, is core temperature reasonably consistent? And we're talking within the same athlete and then from athlete to athlete, so across athletes. And it's important to recognize that news to nobody, we are what's termed homeothermic. And this simply means that our body temperature is kept nearly constant under normal circumstances. Obviously, things can impact this, this home, homeothermic state, pull us away from optimal or what's termed normal. But we, we kind of hover in a pretty narrow range again, under normal circumstances. Um, but what can, what can pull us out of that range? Clearly heat stress can raise both our core temp and our, our shell or our skin, skin temperature, let's just call it our body temperature. But also there's a lot of, uh, uh non-thermal factors that can influence body temperature too. And this is not an inclusive list, but it does include body or an all inclusive. It does include body composition, aerobic fitness, um, heat acclimation, gender and age. Those are a couple of big ones, uh, chronic disease states. So, you know, di diabetes is, uh, one example, hydration status, uh, your cardiovascular function, et cetera. So, so numerous potential effectors of body temperature, even before exercise takes place. And then when we consider exercise and, and the copious amounts of energy we can produce, and in that process, the, geez, the vast amounts of, of, of heat that we produce and have to dissipate since, you know, remember about three quarters of it is given off as heat, only about a quarter of it makes it to the pedals actually does mechanical work. And then consider that the, the matter of the work rate alone shows us that, that different athletes can produce far different amounts of body heat. I mean, someone generating 400 watts of power versus someone generating 150 watts, heck of a lot less heat, heck of a lot less of substrates being metabolized for energy. But 
It, if, if for just a moment we back exercise out of this whole mix here and, and just be a bit more general, normal body temperature is typically pegged at 37 degrees Celsius, uh, 98.6 Fahrenheit. If we've undoubtedly all heard these measurements before. And, and while we normally see slight fluctuations over the course of a day, fever is typically diagnosed at 38 Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit or higher. So we're talking just a one degree bump in Celsius and roughly a two degree bump Fahrenheit has the potential to be significant. So is, is this normal body temperature reliable from person to person to athlete to athlete? And it turns out there's some relatively ample, uh, let's just call it wiggle room. Uh, and fortunately for us, there is a paper uh, pretty recent by Obermeyer and colleagues just uh, from 2017. And it actually sheds light on this very question. And the title kind of says it all. It's individual differences in normal body temperature, colon, a longitudinal big data analysis of patient records. And what these uh, <clears throat> researchers looked at was 243,506, so a heck of a lot of temperature measurements taken from <laughs> 35,488, so well over 35,000 outpatients who neither received a diagnosis for infection nor were prescribed antibiotics. So evidently they were not ill. These are, these are relatively healthy folks. And the researchers found that body temperature ranged from 35.3 Celsius, which is 95.5 Fahrenheit, which is well below the, the norms that I just stated, up to 37.7 Celsius or 99.9 Fahrenheit. So, you know, ostensibly feverish in that case, but not. So this is a range in Celsius of roughly or exactly 2.4 degrees and in Fahrenheit, 4.4 degrees. So that's the, the wiggle room I just described. So the, the point is, is that across a wide, and in this case, a diverse cohort of mixed races, 41% of them were non-white, and genders, 64% of them were women, there's a relatively a broad range of body temperatures. And the overall point for this being is that for a host of reasons, some people simply run hot, some people simply run cold, and it's often regardless of exercise or the conditioning that accompanies it. Interesting. So... Uh, I guess, and we probably don't have studies on this, but it would be fascinating to see that those that do have a lower core temperature, if they end up reaching some sort of like homeothermic level, uh, across the board, like with other people, when they are, you know, active at a, at a specific, you know, range of heart rate right. or, output or something like that. Well, and, so and, and we do very day to day. So, so maybe all these people, it's unlikely at all of them, but maybe that's, they are hovering right around 98.6, but at the time of measurement, they were slightly above, slightly below, but it does show that healthy people can be well above, well below and relatively well, right? It's still mm -hmm. only a couple of degrees either way, but it's not this tiny, narrow little range that you might think below it, I'm hypothermic above it. I'm hyperthermic. It's actually a bit more flexible than, than I understood. When we get into the caloric burn thing, we talk about like your, your, uh, thermoregulatory efficiency, right? In terms of when you're riding on the bike, roughly 25% of your energy mm -hmm. goes to, um, goes to the pedals while is, wait, is that right? Yeah. Optimistically. Um, and, yeah. Yep. And then the, the remainder of your energy consumption is going toward just managing heat. Uh, cause all those tiny little mitochondria put out a ton amount or a huge amount of heat in your body and it needs to get rid of it. So. Yeah. We're uh, hugely mechanically inefficient. Hugely. Yes. Very wasteful. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So in this case, uh, your question directly about like amount of calories burnt, performance, that sort of thing. I'm not sure that's been studied. That would be you'd have to it have has. like a it has yeah it, it has to the to the degree that they can look at through either indirect calorimetry or direct calorimetry, which you know in most cases it's indirect. They're just putting a putting mm -hmm. a person on a bike or on a treadmill and hooking them up to a, a gas exchange machine and measuring actual expired air and saying you're burning this much carbohydrate, this much fat, and therefore this is the amount of, of, of heat that is being put yeah. off. So that can be pretty tightly measured from what I've gathered. Well, I guess what I'm getting at here is you'd have to have a cohort of people that are, are notoriously run cold or run hot, and then you'd have to measure, you know, across the board with some sort of a controlled intervention. You'd have to see what they... Sure. You know, if 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 it's different. Because the question does stand, and, and, and I don't know, Maria, if maybe your operating temperature is higher when you're on the bike and maybe your resting temperature that you typically have is higher as well. You simply don't know. Um, but it is really interesting to, to note this. I think that in terms of practically speaking though, what really matters is you've noticed that you have trouble in the heat. And as a result, what you should be focusing on is ways to manage that heat. One thing that, um, 
uh, is something that I've perhaps doesn't get enough focus when we talk about heat exposure and heat adaptation is the, just the, the psychological effect of heat mm-hmm. exposure and what that can do to help prepare us for those moments. Um, something interesting that I've seen with a lot of core body temperature data and how it's, uh, it's measured is that when athletes report perception of feeling hot, it's typically related to a Delta rather than an absolute figure. So let's just say for, uh, mm-hmm. for kicks, that hundred degrees is when you start to feel really hot of like your core temperature. Okay. Fahrenheit. And if that's the case, uh, you know, you may actually feel hot, so to speak, if you went from 96 to 97 or 97 to 98, just because of that Delta, um, and it made, and it doesn't necessarily relate to the absolute temperature that you're experiencing. And that's something that's really interesting for a lot of us athletes to keep in mind is that our body is pretty good at adapting and managing things, relatively speaking, uh, within a certain range. And if you can just get used to that sensation of feeling hot as you do ramp up that heat and keep it going, then perhaps there's a big benefit in terms of performance and your ability to perform on a day. Clearly, you do not want to mess around with getting too hot. Um, and that's, you know, we should all be doing all that we can to manage that, not riding in dangerously hot conditions, making sure that we're cooling off with you know, liquid with ice coming in and then also cooling yourself off and aiding evaporative cooling with, uh, you know, squirting cold water on you if you can and doing everything you can there. But, uh, it's interesting to remember the fact that if you are exposed to heat regularly, it seems to have less effects, psychologically speaking, less detrimental effect on performance. So maybe in this case, it's a good excuse, Maria, to get into the sauna more often, um, and to experience and to, to do that. And maybe see if you can train your body to get used to that sort of sensation. So then when you're out performing on the bike, it's not as big of a deal. Um, Any more practical uh, things that you want to suggest perhaps for Maria, Chad? Not so much. That's that's really all I have. Awesome. Uh, Enrique says, hello, podcast hosts. I'm a big fan for two years now and have a question about my threshold interval workouts. When I'm under stress and a hard effort, I change to standing. I've heard you talk about this before, but I do it quite regularly in all types of workouts. For me, it is more enjoyable to ride out of the saddle. For example, in my six by 10 tempo workout last week, I started standing halfway through the first interval. Then after a couple minutes in the second interval, and then I stood for the rest of the intervals. I know you've mentioned that specifically, uh, that specificity, forgive me, is the focus with standing or out of the saddle pedaling but I seem to be very different from most athletes with how much I stand. Am I not getting the intended adaptations with my training prescriptions? So this is, uh, I like that last part of the question we've talked about, like whether it's more efficient and you know, efficiency is somewhat plastic, right? Chad, in the sense that like you can become quite efficient at standing and pedaling Mm -hmm. if that's something that you do all the time. But that said, just mechanically speaking, it is less efficient, uh, because you're supporting your body upright and having to balance and the bike is wagging back and forth. There's more muscle contraction going on, more complexity. Mm -hmm. Uh, So staying seated is just mechanically speaking, more efficient. Yes. But the question here is interesting. Am I not getting the intended adaptations with my training prescriptions? Mm-hmm. This is a six by 10 tempo workout that they shared, but we can probably extrapolate this across the, across the spectrum. Right, Chad? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think it's unlikely that they're, that Enrique is missing the mark by much, if at all, uh, just getting out of the saddle. Yes. It may compromise your aerobic efficiency a bit. You're involving a bit more muscle mass. Oxygen consumption may go up a little, but if anything, that's just laying a foundation for greater aerobic capabilities down the road. So you're, you're, you're taxing and <clears throat> excuse me, in the case of, Tempo work, it's not, it's, it's very aerobic work. Maybe you're pushing slightly to the higher side of things by being out of the saddle, but based on how you're describing things, Enrique, it sounds like you're very good at it. So I don't know that, I mean, from a seated to a standing position, if you're not noticeably breathing harder, working harder, feeling as though this is more difficult, I don't, again, I, I, don't, I just don't think the difference between the two is enough to, to be concerned with, concerned with. And you're definitely not missing the, the physiological adaptation mark at all. I mean, there, we, we have power levels for a reason. One bleeds into the next. They're all ranges of numbers for a reason. There's not one particular percentage of anything that is going to yield that one thing you're looking for. It's all very flexible. It's all gray areas, one into the next. Yeah. It's kind of like working in the arrow position, right? Um, in the sense that like mm-hmm. when you're working in a different yeah. position on the bike, you're still doing the work. Um, you're doing it with a higher degree of specificity and Enrique, if in this case your race has you 
just standing for the majority of the time, you know, maybe you're doing just huge long climbs and that's the majority of the sort of racing that you do or riding, then yeah, this is pretty darn specific to what you're well, doing it, and it's not too bad. And this almost sounds like an opposite, opposite scenario. Whereas, you know, most people, when they get into the aero position, RPE goes up, power maybe tanks a little bit or becomes a bit more stochastic and they just, they suffer in the, in the process. Whereas Enrique is getting out of the saddle because it, it just feels better. It's, it's a, it's a calling. It's not, I can't meet the power demand. Otherwise it's, it's, I just want to be up. I feel better riding up. So, you know, you, you're probably just very good at it. And my only place for concern really is what type of athlete are you? Cause if you're a time trialist, no, this is, this is a terrible approach. You, you need to be able to <laughs> yeah. create seated power. You need to be able to create aerodynamic power. Uh, yeah. if you're a triathlete, same thing, probably pretty terrible approach, but if you're an athlete who can get in and out of the saddle a lot, who isn't paying a bit, big aerodynamic penalty, who for instance, excels in the hills and picks hill climb time trials and hilltop finishes and manages power really well and remains seated when not climbing. This, this sounds like a very workable approach. Yeah. If you're the sort of athlete that has to manage traction as well on those steep climbs, then mm. I would say that this is not the best approach. You want to be able to put out that power when you're seated. Um, I know this is a hot button topic with Nate on a podcast, a, a handful of months ago, but you need to be able to put out that power. And, uh, if you can only put out big power or uh, when you're really under stress, you have to get out of the saddle. It gets more difficult to maintain traction. So that's, that's something you want to keep in mind. And that, that does bring up another good point is that you, you should be really any kind of athlete. You should be, unless all you do are hill climb time trials, you should be good at both. You should be able to yes. create, generate, you know, s strong, high, uh, on, on target seated power. If that's something that's out of your reach and the only way that you can reach it is by getting out of the saddle. Again, that would be cause for concern. It doesn't sound like that's what's going on. It sounds like it's a, 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 a entirely by choice. Yeah. And second to specificity, I think strategically, it's a bad decision to just be good at standing uh, when things get hard because it, you'll just be, a, it'll be an easy tell that uh, things are hard for you or that you're going to attack or anything else mm -hmm. because they'll be like, ah, oh, Enrique's out of the saddle again. Um, well, as Ryan, as Ryan Standish put it last week, and I don't know if it was during the podcast or prior to it, but seated yeah. power is is just fun to toy with or, or, yes. or to use to toy with others, to simply start to ride away from someone <clears throat> with no apparent change in how hard you're working, just to start to glide away, leaving everyone else wondering what is going on. I, I, I simply can't hold on anymore. Nothing's changing, yet here I am getting tailed off. Yeah, well, Van Aert had his amazing uh, just roll away from the field that we saw mm -hmm. quite a few times last year. Yeah. Um, Doesn't cross yeah. races too. I know, right? Yeah. Which, by the way, <clears throat> cross racing recently, Chad? So good. It's been so good. So uh, good right now. If it was up to Chad and I, we just like nerd out about uh, bike racing for the whole podcast. Go here. two but, hours um, on just the last five yeah. cycle cross races, the, the <laughs> it's been Christmas to New Year's gap. Incredible. It's been mm -hmm. so good. So, um, but anyways, uh, so this one, I, I, I've, I would encourage you on Rick to, to use this just like we do with our workout techs. When you're doing your intervals, try to progressively spend more time in the saddle just to make yourself more versatile. Uh, it's, it's never a good thing to be put into a corner. In this case, if you can expand your skill set, and this goes for other athletes that are thinking, I can never get out of the saddle, do the opposite. Start to increase the amount of time that you spend in the saddle, but never get to the point where you're too far over the center line there. Make sure that you're, you know, in terms of uh, being, you know, preferring one or the other. Just use them as tools. And if you can use both of them interchangeably, then you're even more capable when the moment needs it. So, uh, yeah, that's that would be my, my recommendations, but it's not like you're not doing the training. So... Uh, last question, Chad from Corey, uh, says how much extra rest is too much? There are places during workouts that are obviously work phases and non-work phases. And sometimes rest doesn't quite uh, describe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. We feel it on that Corey. Uh, sometimes I'll utilize the non-work to let the dog out or get a new cup of coffee or use the bathroom. How much break during these specific phases is ruining my workout? This is, uh, this one's I feel like really subjective to the work that's, that you're doing and the intention of the workout, right, Chad? Absolutely. Absolutely is. Yeah. First off, Corey, I love that you've uh, recognized that rest doesn't quite cover it, which is why I, I try to steer away from the term whenever possible and just refer to it as recovery. And recovery Im implies, can imply a number of things, just recovery of resources, recovery of frame of mind, recovery of whatever. You're just, you're just trying to get recovered so that you can go again. 
not seldom, if ever, restful. <laughs> uh, and what you're doing, again, depends on the nature of the workout. If you're trying to accumulate long, close set durations, um, and, and really the workout's going to frame that. It's going to tell you you've got a 30-second break. If you can let the dog out in 30 seconds, go for it. It's not going to be restful, I promise. It's going to be a mad dash. <laughs> um, but if you have like a five-minute gap in between, you're thinking, well, geez, do I have to sit here and noodle the whole time? What am I really gaining? I'm going to go let the dog out. Is that harming my workout? Really improbable. So just just kind of balance it with, with, with good sense. I mean, there are cases that are really specific where we want to – I mean, there's, there's uh, research that shows that passive rest with something like VO2 max intervals can be super beneficial on this side of things because it's allowing you to maintain higher quality in subsequent intervals. Whereas – uh, active rest is beneficial during it, it. And it does come down to, I think, different forms of adaptation, whether it steers it more central or more peripheral. I mean, it can get really nuanced, but that's why you try to leave those details to us and just follow the format of the workout. But when that format does include long gaps, I mean, common sense says if I'm sitting here for five minutes, breathing through my nose and downright bored, ready for the interval well in advance of the start of the next interval, What's the harm in hopping off the bike and grabbing a cup of coffee or, or going to the bathroom, which honestly is one of the best reasons because that's a huge distraction when you're trying to do work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and going back to what you said about VO2 max and, and passive rest versus active rest, we talked about that a handful of episodes ago. And what that really showed is that when for the first one or two intervals, they saw a difference, but then thereafter it actually, mm -hmm. you know, it didn't end up being any beneficial, any more beneficial to do passive rest, which is mm -hmm. important to remember. So, um, yeah. any, anytime I describe something as nuanced, that's kind of me tongue in cheek saying, don't fret details as small as these. Yeah. It, it, it's just, For sure. <laughs> just trying to put it nicely. The one thing that I would, uh, th if, if your recovery and there's probably some sort of like magic ratio for each energy system uh, that, that that works here that I'm unaware of, and it would be cool to to nail it down. But if your recovery is something that you feel is short, like this is this feels short, or I wish it was a little longer, that's a good sign to not stretch it longer if you can't, because the hmm. chances are that limited rest is intentional. If the recovery is to the point where you feel like, oh, I could get back to this then it's likely not going to be uh, negatively affecting the workout adversely if you take a you know a short break uh, within that. I personally really like to, and this is just a mental trick that really keeps me motivated, and I don't know if it's true. Uh, I have no way of proving if it's true. <laughs> but I, when I adhere to my rest intervals with precision, I really get a lot of motivation with from that because I see a lot of people do the work but then they give themselves as much rest as they need in between the work. And when I'm in a race, I've never once been able to tell everybody to hold on so that I can recover and do another effort. And I really like the ability of workouts that are, you know, stepping me up in the right way to limit that rest strategically and intentionally and progressively over time. Uh, it does make you much more dynamic later on. And it also increases your abilities within that zone. So, you know, if I'm looking at something and I have 30 thirties, you bet I am going to adhere to those 30 thirties just with a, with a, with a, you know, a ruler, I'll be out there measuring everything, right? If it's something where I have a five minute rest in between intervals, that's not as important to me. So, um, just, you know, maybe that litmus test of, do I wish this rest was a bit longer? Maybe that's a good sign that you should respect the rest, the, the constraints of that rest recovery interval. Um, hopefully that, that kind of helps that one night. And one thing that I really, Nate talks about this a lot on the podcast too. I think a lot of athletes underappreciate the value of just pedaling nonstop for an hour. doesn't mean pedaling at the same intensity for an hour, but just not stopping for an hour. There is huge benefit in that. And, and I don't know what it is. Uh, this is something that Keegan absolutely believes as well that, you know, in his mind, it's like, well, if you coast at all during a ride, like you know, start over and, you know, he <laughs> likes to always be on the gas and always be hitting whatever target he needs to hit. And I do think that there is a lot of power in that when you're talking about like lower intensity work in particular, um, about being able to just manage that, that low, slow and dull, uh, but difficult to push through pain that you get with that lower intensity work once it stretches into the longer durations. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that's, that's good practical advice for you, Corey. It all depends uh, in terms of physiologically speaking, if it ruins a workout or anything else like that. But you can be sure that if you're taking adequate rest, you're probably, or not adequate rest, but 
a you know, generous rest between every single interval when it's not scheduled, you're probably not fulfilling the exact intention of the workout. So hopefully that's been a great refresher for you all on some different habits that we could all be doing or different things that could be affecting our training positively or negatively. If you appreciated this episode, if you like it, please share it with friends. That's how we continue to grow Trainer Road. Go to trainerroad.com, sign up. It would mean the world to us. That's how we continue to grow. And also, if you want to submit your podcast questions, go to trainerroad.com slash podcast. Rate this podcast on Spotify, on iTunes. Share it with others. We're, I think, still the top-rated podcast on Spotify for cycling, which is wonderful, and we need to extend that lead. So if you wouldn't mind helping us, we would love it. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.